And our subject is personal faith is vital. So many people don't understand that, friends. Personal faith is vital for any walk with God. Now, when Christ said these words, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, his disciples, it is recorded, were exceedingly amazed. They were astonished. It follows an encounter which Christ had with a rich young ruler. He had asked this man to give up all that he had. Not that that is what Christ usually asks. In fact, nowhere does he ask as a condition of salvation, of being accepted by God, that people give up their wealth or their riches. But he did, in a singular way, to this young man, because it was a test of him. Because the trouble with this young man, this, I don't know how young, but he was extremely rich, obviously with vast lands and possessions, but uh, the trouble with him was that he was very self-righteous. He seemed to think that he had good standing before God. He seems to be asking Christ, not so much what shall I do, but what can I endow? Should I buy something for the community? Should I sponsor a building, civic building, something significant? Whatever it was, it was probably something along those lines. But Christ reads his heart, and he knows that this young man, well, his God is his wealth. He might superficially seem a nice enough young man, he is probably, you know, undoubtedly, I would think, in the cultural context, a worshipper regularly. But he loves his wealth and what it gets for him. And that is his God. And so he is challenged to give it up. And he can't. The decision doesn't take him very long. Only moments. And he goes away sorrowful. That is out of the question. He's too attached to all those things. And it's in the light of that that Christ says these words, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. What an interesting term, the kingdom of God. You learn a lot even before we get into the passage. The kingdom of God is something you have to enter into even on earth. It isn't something which everyone is in or a member of. Not even among the Jews of those days where they were all regular worshippers. It could not be said that they were members of the kingdom of God. Membership of the kingdom of God requires personal faith, not just cultural worship, not just a formal habit, it requires your own personal act of faith in God, in Christ particularly, the Saviour. Entry into the kingdom of God depends on your conversion. You have to be brought to God, converted to him, undergo this great experience that we call conversion to Christ. Not everyone is in it. So Christ speaks of failing to enter the kingdom or entering the kingdom. If that is so, if entering into the kingdom by personal faith and personal experience of conversion is the only way, this is of tremendous importance to all of us. It determines whether we go to heaven or it determines whether we are judged by God at the end of life and rejected by him eternally. It depends not on our culture, our customs, our habits, but whether we have personal faith and whether we've experienced this conversion to Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God, it needs to be entered. It's almost enough to learn that fact alone tonight. And let it 
re-echo in our minds and hearts. In the days ahead, the kingdom of God has to be entered by faith. I have not entered it, we may have to say to ourselves. I do not have this personal faith. I have not had this experience of conversion. That alone is possibly the most important realization you can ever come to. The kingdom of God has to be entered. Not all are in it. There are impediments to entering it. We read here in this passage that extreme riches may be an impediment because the love of things in this world, and you don't have to be very rich for this, but the love of things in this world can put us off ever seeking Christ because we're all for this world and things and possessions and status and looking good and all the rest of it. And no time for God, for eternity, for Christ, for knowing him. So there are serious impediments we have to come to terms with, with entering the kingdom of God. It is hard, we read that very clearly in verse 23. A rich man shall hardly enter. That means to say it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because maybe he's got a lot of gods in this world that he's got to give up first. And then the great statement, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, this is such a surprising statement that over the years, people have tried to explain it away. Ah, I know what this means, say some. Why, the eye of the needle, that refers to a gate in Jerusalem. Yes, it does. There is a gate roughly named along these lines. Christ wasn't talking about a literal camel and a literal needle. He was referring to that gate. He was saying it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for an overburdened camel to squeeze through that gate. Well, you can't explain it away like that because the greater possibility, probability, is that the gate was named after the parable, not the other way around. Oh, no. Christ uses undoubtedly the illustration of a camel. And I shouldn't waste your time with this, but there's another way people try to get out of the shock that this illustration gives, and it's this. The Greek word for camel, with a little adjustment, can be turned into a word which refers to a cable, a ship's cable, or rope. Well, that would make quite a pretty illustration. It has the same meaning, really, but struggling to get a rope through the eye of a needle. But it's not that. That's not authentic. No, it was a camel that Christ is referring to. A camel through the eye of a needle. Well, it's impossible, utterly impossible. And it's not just for the rich. It's for everyone. With men, it isn't possible to be converted, Christ goes on to say. His disciples are very shocked. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them, and the phrase is significant. He fixed his eye upon them, as though to make them aware he is going to say something of tremendous importance. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. It is impossible for us to have faith in Christ and to be converted to him by ourselves. We cannot bring about our own conversion. We cannot earn or deserve the favor of God. We cannot earn or work our way into heaven. We're too far from God. We're too sinful. We're too condemned. You think of God's holiness and the perfection of his realm. And then you think of human sin. Oh, friends, we'll elaborate in due course, but there's no possibility. A camel going through the eye of a needle. How absurd. How impossible. Camels are extraordinary creatures. We don't have them roaming the streets in London. 
There are some people here who have first-hand knowledge of camels. I do not have first-hand knowledge of camels. I have second-hand, third-hand knowledge of camels, just like you. Things I've read here and there, things I've picked up, that's the best I can do. But nevertheless, camels are extraordinary. They tell us, we learn, that a camel can cover 75, 80 miles in a day. He can carry the equivalent weight of up to six men in baggage, in a load. You know, of course, it's famous that the camel moves his feet on each side together. So when he walks, he kind of rolls, which is why he's the ship of the desert with that rolling gait. Yeah. A two-humper, we hear, can go for 25, 30 days without water. It's a tremendous creature. The biggest animal that anyone in those days in that region would have seen. And a very wonderful creature in its way. <laughs> it can drink gallons and gallons and gallons in a few minutes. Extraordinary. And I remember once, I can't remember any of this, but reading something about its biology. It has most peculiar red blood cells and everything else adapted for survival in, uh, with dehydration and so on. It's extraordinarily made and adapted for its purpose. And yet for all the wonders of the camel, it was used in warfare, was used in farming. <laughs> I read somewhere that if you can get camel cream, it's the most low-fat cream you can get. Well, that might appeal to some, but I don't know what the taste is like. Anyway, you can, it's in farming, agriculture, freight, of course, the freight ship of the ancient world, in war, and in personal transportation for wealthy, for rich people. So a camel was highly valued in those days. But for all the virtues you can find in a camel, there's one thing it definitely cannot do, and that is go through the eye of a needle. And anybody would be attempt, uh, mad to attempt it. And of course, the camel would hardly cooperate. And it's a perfect illustration for us. Just as it is absurd to think of a camel going through the eye of a needle, it is impossible for us to enter the kingdom of heaven except by the mercy of God and free salvation, freely given. Salvation must be by grace alone, undeserved, unearned, because I come to God and I trust in Christ and the price he's paid for sinners in suffering and dying, taking the punishment of our sin on Calvary's cross and yield him my life and ask for mercy and free salvation. That's what I have to do, because it's impossible that I could ever enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, any other way. Well, some people think they can. Don't tell me that. I can mend my life. I can do good things. I can worship. I can earn the favor of God. But it's impossible. It's arrogant to think you can do that. It's pulling God down from his holiness and bringing him down to your standard. Don't we know ourselves? We are sinful people. We've got a great record of sins behind us. We are all kinds of things that are wrong with our state of heart. We may be proud, we may be deceitful, we may be exceedingly selfish. There are all kinds of things the matter with us. And that sin must be punished. And God cannot let us in to heaven like that. And he cannot greatly deal with us on earth or befriend us or be kind to us in that condition. So he must change us and he must cleanse us and forgive us and bring us to himself in repentance and in faith. Oh, dear friends, the eye of a needle. Going through the eye of a needle. When you stand before God in judgment, the judgment will be like going through the eye of a needle. 
you'll be under such intense examination and all your sin record will be brought up before you. And here on earth, going through the eye of a needle is enduring the judgment of God. Let's look again at this 23rd verse, or rather the 26th verse. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What does it mean? It is possible for my sin to be forgiven and my guilt to be washed away with God. It is possible for me to receive a new life and a new character with God. It is possible for me to be able to enjoy communion with God and walk with him and have his help and his blessing with God. It is possible. What makes it possible? Christ makes it possible because he came to earth and he suffered and died on the cross and he bore our sin if we believe in him. He bore our sin on Calvary's cross. He bore it away. Oh, dear friends, we cannot do justice to that when we describe it, how Christ took the literal punishment that we should have borne forever and forever and the punishment due to billions of people who would repent of their sin and believe in him throughout the history of time. And he took pain and separation from the Father and anguish and bore our hell for us. We just cannot even begin to take it in. What love is this that Christ would do such a thing for creatures like us who deserve nothing, who are rebels against him? Christ makes it possible. With God, all things are possible. And my forgiveness becomes possible and new life for me and a place in heaven because with God, Christ came and suffered and died in my place. That is an astonishing thing. So I can repent. If Christ had never suffered and died on Calvary's cross to take away the punishment of sin for his people, repentance wouldn't get me anywhere. I could say, God, forgive me. But how could he forgive me? My sin still has to be punished. But because Christ has suffered the punishment, now I can say, Lord, forgive me. Wash away my guilt and my sin. I acknowledge it. I am that sinful person who deserves to be condemned. Lord, forgive me. It's possible because Christ has died. I can say to God, oh Lord, give me a new life. Change my nature. Give me character. Make me different. Take away my awful sin tendency, which is constantly there. Why, well, it's not worth praying that prayer. But it is now, because Christ, who is God, has come and borne my sin and offered up his own righteousness for me. And therefore, I can have standing with God, and God can change me and bless me. He can still be just, because he's punished my sin in Christ he can still be just because Christ has offered his perfect righteousness on my behalf so God can reward me for righteousness I never had and give me a place in heaven. All things are possible with God because of Christ and because of what Christ has done. It's possible for me to trust him. It's possible for me to be converted. It's possible for me to have communion with him. It's possible for me to go to heaven. All things are possible. That's the teaching of the passage. Now a camel notes, so we hear, so we learn, can be obstinate, stiff-necked, Stubborn, determined. In fact, I remember being surprised when I first heard the phrase, camels are very argumentative. But of course, they can't speak English 
or Arabic or anything else, but apparently they can be very argumentative and unpleasant when they wish to be. And then I also have read that camels are incredibly unintelligent. Now there may be some ways in which they're intelligent. Every creature has a dash of cunning, but yes, they are said to be unintelligent. And I thought to myself, how like us when it comes to God. People who may be very yielding to other people, very persuadable, when it comes to God, get astonishingly obstinate and determined and resistant. People who are never quarrelsome suddenly get quarrelsome and bitter with God. People who have immense intelligence and they romp through their examinations and rise in their professions and things like that can be incredibly unintelligent with God. So the camel aptly describes us in our attitude to God. Here is God who will forgive us and will change us and be our God and our guide and our friend and take us to heaven to everlasting bliss. We will not have him. We will not turn to him. I like camels at their worst, whatever possesses us. And we're such fools to reject God, to reject Christ, to reject salvation, to reject heaven. Who could be a bigger fool than that, friends? So the camel is surprisingly like us. It's not going through the eye of a needle. It's not doing a lot of things. Oh, dear friends, be careful in your attitude to God. You think of God, triune Godhead, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One, and yet somehow three, the great mystery of the Godhead. Equally God, equally eternal, equally wonderful and majestic and powerful and divine. The Father for his part, if we come to Christ, announces, pronounces our complete forgiveness, makes a declaration, this person is clean and I will deal with this person as though he, she had never sinned. Christ, for his part, comes down into the world to suffer on Calvary, to purchase our salvation. The Holy Spirit, for his part, comes into our lives and melts our hearts and makes us amenable to Christ and puts within us a desire for salvation and for Christ, brings us to repentance and then transforms our lives. Isn't that astonishing? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together for the good and the blessing and the happiness of the people who come to Jesus Christ. And we say, I will not listen. I will not come. I will not respond. How stubborn we are. What fools we are. Oh, dear friends, think of these things. There's self-righteousness in everyone. I'm not going to confess my sin. I don't believe this. I'm not going to see myself as a sinner for whom there's no hope. If I'm coming to God, I'm coming in my own right. I'm going to earn it. I'm going to deserve it. How foolish we are. We don't see our sin and our need. Oh, you see this. I remember a man some years ago who said to me, He'd committed a crime, he'd done a bad thing, he was going to have to go before the courts. And this is how he put it. It sticks in my mind because it's a remarkable statement. He said, I have unfortunately found myself on the wrong side of the law. Why, that's brilliant actually. He hadn't done anything wrong. It was all a misfortune. He had found himself on the wrong side of the law. But that's typical of us. Before we come to Christ, before we're converted, we excuse everything we do, 
we paint ourselves much, much better than we are. We were offended by the gospel, which says we're lost sinners who need a savior. Isn't it typical? Why, friends, as I have mentioned this before, I'm sure, but uh, there's a very famous interview with a, an American gangster that was shown many years ago on American television, but it's often quoted. And this one of the most famous crooks and killers and gangsters of the American crime scene, when once out of prison, was interviewed about his life by some celebrity interviewer. And he looked at his interviewer when he was asked about his murders, and he said this, I never killed anyone who didn't have it coming to him. Even a murderer, why well, it's almost laughable, cannot see that he's done anything sinful. There was a reason, there was an excuse. And that's us too. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not as bad as you make out. I don't deserve hell, but we do, friends. We're proud and selfish. We're horrible people, really, in our hearts. And we've got such a sin record. Well, we have attributes, just as the camel has many attributes. Human beings can do remarkable and wonderful things. And they can push out the frontiers of knowledge. And they can do heroic things sometimes. Astonishing achievements. But they cannot get into the kingdom of God any more than the camel can go through the eye of a needle. Not without God's forgiveness not without repentance, not without belief, personal faith in Jesus Christ. That's essential. And oh, friends, how much we need pardon and life. Or without it, you'll spend your life, if I may press the illustration, you'll spend your life rather like a camel. A camel with its rolling gait that's what life will be for you. A kind of uncertain journey. A limited life. I think it's a little over 40 years for a camel. But a limited life you'll have because you'll have no spiritual experience, no relationship with God, no spiritual adventure, nothing of that kind. No purpose, no meaning. And like the camel, you'll carry heavy burdens all your life. You'll be a burdened person, weighed down with baggage, because there'll always be your guilty conscience. There'll always be your battling through life without the help of God. You'll always be ignorant of God and unaware of the real meaning of life. All your hopes and dreams, some will be fulfilled, most will be frustrated and disappointed. A life journey without God can be illustrated by the burdensome trek of the camel, oh dear friends, through its long journey. With God, all things are possible. Bear with me as we come to conclusion. All things are possible with God. Just listen to the sense. Pardon is possible because Christ died on Calvary's cross. Pardon is possible for unclean people burdened by sin. Because Christ died, there is life for the dead. You can have spiritual life put into you because you trust in Christ and believe in him. With, with Christ, because of him, there is sight for the blind. You couldn't understand the things of God. But when you came to Christ and repented of your sin, because he suffered and died for you, to pay the price of salvation for you, he can give you sight. And you have new understanding and a new depth as a person. Because of Christ, there is a reward for debtors. You were in debt to God. You owed him so much because of your sin. You'd stolen his air, stolen his life, stolen your body from him. You owe him. And yet he gives to you blessing and happiness and reward. 
because of Christ, if you believe in him and that he died for you. Character for the perverted, citizenship for enemies, an enemy of Christ against him. And yet, because he died on Calvary for my forgiveness, I can be given citizenship and membership of the kingdom of God. Liberty for the condemned, free from the condemnation of sin, free from being governed by Satan, the enemy of souls, doing as I am tempted. Just a weak, poor thing tossed around in life by the forces about me. Oh, friends, all things are possible with God. I must conclude. I remind you of the verses as I do so. Christ's shock statement, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Yes, it's impossible to be saved by my works or my strength or my deserving. The disciples were shocked. But Jesus beheld them, looked very solemnly at them, and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That is, being saved. Oh, friends, may you come to Christ, repent of your sin, submit your life to him, trust in what he did on Calvary's cross, that's the only way. It's the only way to be cleansed, only way to be forgiven. How much we need him when you go home. Open your Bible at Matthew 19. Look at these words. Let them sink into you. The kingdom of God. You are not automatically a member. You need to enter it by putting your faith in Christ, repenting of your sin, and yielding your life to him. Because with him, all these wonderful things are possible. Let's pray together. Oh God, our gracious heavenly Father, teach us and move in our hearts and help us. Oh Lord, we have all been rebels and often for long periods of time and obstinate and stubborn, and we pray that thou wilt soften our hearts and bring us to see our desperate need, or oh, that we may enter into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen. Amen.